Well, good morning. I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us. And for those of you who um, are here, thanks for working with us on our seating. We're trying to do the best we can to get groups so we can maintain distancing and get as many people as we can. So thanks for working with us on that. When I was a little guy, oh, eight or nine or so, against my will, I was drafted to help my brother sell Boy Scout candy. And so my dad would be in the car. I would have a wagon. I'd go on one side of the street. He would go on the other. And I had to walk up and knock on the door. And yeah, just I didn't have any choice. So I selling Boy Scout candy. Would you consider buying? But you know, it was a kind of against my will, and I guess I got to do it, and it was kind of agony to do it. I, I adjusted to that. I share that by saying, you know, we're called to speak for God. We're, we live in a world system that intentionally excludes God, and, and God draws us out. Uh, he draws us to himself, and, and the reason we don't go right to heaven is he's got a mission for us in church, and that's to speak for him. And we've sung, and we are singing about God's kingdom, and we won't fully experience that until he comes back, but we experience that in part. And, and that begins as it, it takes root in people's heart, and, and we have the responsibility to tell people about our, our experience with Jesus. And, and at times it can feel like selling Boy Scout candy. I don't want to do it, but i got to do it. But there's got to be more. There's something more to that, where we have strength to speak for God. And I, I want to talk about that this morning. So if you've got a Bible, if you would open that, as Lindsay mentioned, to Exodus 3 and Exodus 4, we'll go through these two chapters wrestling with this question, where do we find the strength to speak for God? Where do we find the strength to speak for God? Now, as you're turning there, uh, a question I have. So when we were selling Boy Scout candy, it was a dollar a box, and then the person who sold it, you got a commission for a dime. But here's what my older brother did to me. He gave me a nickel, and he kept a nickel for every box I sold. I think I ought to sue him, don't you? I mean, for lost wages, he's a doctor. He could afford that. And with interest, I'd be independently wealthy. Think about that. You can get back to me whether or not that's a good idea. But here's where we are in our passage. Um, God, back in the day, uh, decided he would raise up a people to represent him. And, and he started with Abraham. Kind of Abraham was a happy pagan. Nothing meritorious about him. But he showed up. He said, I want you to follow me. And so Abraham and his wife Sarah did. They had a son Isaac, a son Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. There was a lot of dysfunction in that family. Uh, they turned on a favorite son who was Joseph, sold him into slavery, thought they'd left him for dead. God worked through that to use Joseph uh, in a time of famine. The Pharaoh in Egypt had a dream, and he was just flummoxed. And at the time, Joseph was in jail, and somebody said, I've heard of this guy. And Joseph interprets the dream, and Pharaoh says, you know, I think I want you to lead my famine relief program because they had seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And Joseph did that, and then the whole family came to Egypt and lived with favor for a generation. But then a new Pharaoh came along, a new king, and didn't know Israel, and he was, he was really concerned about this and stoked people's fears, and they tried to work him to death, and then when that didn't happen, they really instituted genocide. See a Jewish boy born, kill him, pitch him in the Nile, and in, uh, found out a couple of uh, midwives that wouldn't go along with that. And in Exodus 2, we, we f focused on one specific boy his name was Moses. His mom gave birth to him and hit him in the reeds. And then Pharaoh's daughter found him. And long story short, Moses got raised in the privilege of being an Egyptian, but in fact he was Jewish. At one point he saw a Jewish, uh, an Egyptian person taking advantage of a Jewish person. He killed the Egyptian person. When Pharaoh heard of that, he was mad. And so Moses is on the run. Moses is a fugitive. And he goes about 200 miles to Midian. He's on the backside of a desert. In the meantime, uh, Israel is continuing to suffer in slavery. It would be a total of 400 years that they would do that. And they cried out to God, and it seemed God hadn't heard. But at the end of chapter 2, we said, yeah, God, he, he, he heard, and then he remembered, and he saw, and he took notice. And, and so we get the idea God's beginning to act, and here we go in chapter 3. So Moses, he's still on the backside of the desert, was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
The angel of God appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. Moses said, whoa, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When God saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, and the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he identifies himself, God does. He says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. You've got to be afraid. This is creator God. He said, you know, you've heard, Moses, you've heard about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're your forefathers back there. Yeah, I was there. I was before them, actually. I called them. I, I'm not God. And Moses thinks, wow, I'm in some pretty extraordinary company. So he falls on his face. And he says to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because they're taskmaster for I'm aware of their suffering. I have, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. This is good news. Israel thought for years our cries aren't getting out. No, no, no. God's heard. And, and what he was doing is uh, the Egyptians were a very ethnocentric people. So there was no intermarrying with a, uh, another race. So God was raising up a nation, was growing a nation, a pure nation for himself. But, you know, if they were comfortable in there, uh, they wouldn't leave. And so they got in the sovereignty of God that the slavery happened. And, and so they, they have motivation to go. And God says, I've got a land for you. Isn't that great? Well, we think so, but, but for Moses, maybe not. Here's what it says. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Yeah, yeah it's going to happen, but, but Moses, you're him. You're, you're, you're the person. You're going to go, and you're going to speak for me. And what you're going to say to Pharaoh is, hey, you need to let these people go. Now, these folks, they're free labor. They're a big part of Pharaoh's GDP, okay? Uh, I mean, he gets, gets a lot of bang out of them, and he doesn't have to pay them anything. And, and yeah, I don't know that Pharaoh's going to, I don't know that he's going to be really on board with that. And, and, and Moses, is, he's thinking that. Uh, so Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Hey, hey, hey. I've been herding sheep for the last 40 years on the backside of the desert. And you're sending me to the king of the most powerful nation in the world. And, and, and you want me to say, hey, you need to let him go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think he's going to listen. Verse 12, God says, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. You ever felt that way? God lays it on your heart to talk to this person. And like they're really popular, or they're really handsome or beautiful, or they're really successful. And you think, why are they going to listen to me? Moses was feeling that way. And he's going to have a message that Pharaoh doesn't want to hear. Why should I go? Where do we find the strength to speak for God? Well, verse 12, God says, I'm going to be with you. Here's where we find the strength to speak for God. In the certainty of God's presence. In the certainty of God's presence. I, well, that person, that, that situation, that, that, that's just overwhelming. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. You know, I was in... Uh, Fifth grade, 
We played dodgeball. I don't think they play dodgeball anymore. But in, in the PE class, all the guys down at this end, all the girls down at that end. And, you know, we were just at that age where, uh, you know, girls were kind of cute. But they're still pretty annoying. And so it's kind of like, yeah, I see you. And, and, and the boys are, man, we are, we are strutting. Because we're bigger and we're kind of into you, and the girls are kind of back there cowering. But here's where the equation changed. Mr. Pluhart was the PE teacher, and he was about 6'2. And he said, I'm going to play with the girls. Oh, that changed everything. His presence, all of a sudden, they're kind of strutting, and the guys were kind of cowering. Why? Because they got six foot two, Mr. Pluhart on there. He's really, and, and they won, by the way. They won big. That was a game changer. You have got the presence of God. I have got the presence of God. And so when it's overwhelming, God says, go forward. But Moses, he's not convinced. Verse 13, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel. And I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say, huh, what's his name? What shall I say to them? Hey, 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 you haven't seen me in 40 years, and the last time I left, I was on the run. I was a fugitive. But I heard from God, and you're not going to believe this story, but he wants me to lead you out as a nation. Yeah, that sounds a little wacky. <laughs> God, who, who, who should I say to them? Here's, here's what God says. Verses 14 and 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. Furthermore, God said to Moses, then you shall say to the sons of Israel, the God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. I am who I am. That's a construct that says, I've always been, I presently am, and I will always be. I am the one outside of eternally. I am an eternally existent. And oh, by the way, just for a reference point, those, those forefathers that you honor because then they've died, I was there. I, I'm their God. I, I'm actually the one who called Abraham and I brought about Isaac and I brought about Jacob. I, that, that, that is who sent. So verses 16 to 18, Moses gathers the elders and God begins to speak. And, and so we pick it up in verse 19. This is God speaking. He says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. And that's what the rest, much of Exodus can be, is God's compulsion to get them to leave. So he says, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which will I do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. And I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and shall be when you go, you will not go empty-handed, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Did you get that? God says, when I get done, not only are you going to go, you're going to be free to go, but they're going to be giving you stuff. They're going to be giving you articles of silver and gold, and they're going to be going, hey, hey, we want to... <laughs> We want to bless you as you go. Be on your way. What's Israel got for resources? Not much. They're enslaved. No army. No treasury to speak of. And they're going to go up to the king, the most powerful nation on earth, and, and they're going to go getting stuff on the way out. Do you believe that? You believe that? Now, now, some of you are here, and you're thinking about it, and you're considering God's Word, and, and you're not certain, and that's okay. I, I want to, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're thinking about it. Now, some of us, we've been around a while, and, and, and we say we believe this. In fact, it's a, it's a part of the doctrinal statement. We believe it's the Word of God. We believe God really did this, and we believe God's eternal. C.S. Lewis had this example of uh, God. Think about an author who writes a book. He's not, the author's not constrained by the, the time frame in the book. A day could be a minute or a thousand years, or he can do as he wants, and he can move, and he can change, and he, he's, just, he's just outside of that. Do you believe that's our God? 
Because that's what we're saying right here. He said, I get it. He's just begging it. They're this and this. But, but I can do what I want. And many of you are saying, or, so, yes, of course. Why? why, Andy, why would you even ask? Okay, here's why I ask. Some people who profess Jesus and they believe the Word of God and they believe God's eternal, some people are freaking out because of the election coming up. And their concern is, if this person gets reelected or that person gets elected, I mean, it is done. It is done. They're acting as if, fill in the blank, President Trump or Vice President Biden becomes president, then, then you know, it's, it's all lost. All is lost. As if everything rides on a president. It doesn't. We serve a God who is in control, and he takes a backwoods sheep herder who's been in the desert for 40 years. He says, I'm going to send you, and the people of Egypt, the most powerful nation, they're going to be giving you stuff as you go. He's in control. So why do you bring this up? So let me roll back the clock 44 years. I realize many of you weren't alive then, but indulge me. It was election night, 1976. What had gone on the last two years is Richard Nixon had been caught up in the Watergate scandal. He had resigned, and uh, Gerald Ford had taken over, and then Ford had pardoned Nixon, and people were in a tizzy about that. He shouldn't have, and he should have, and it's going to cost him the election. And in 1976, Jimmy Carter didn't win the presidential election. I, and I want to take you back to my house in Darien, Illinois. I was a about to turn 16, I was a junior in high school, and it became clear that Carter was going to win the presidential election. Okay? Got the stage? My dad. Just pace the, pace the house. Why? Because, because Carter had become president, and, and this, con- this country was just going, I mean, it's just, it's just going to be terrible. And, and I was supposed to graduate. I was scheduled to graduate uh, a year and a half later, in May of 78, and walking, seeing my dad walk around, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make it to graduation. <laughs> or if we do, we're going to be a Russian puppet. I'm going to, you know what, I'll bet I'm going to have to take another, like a Russian government class and a, a civics course in Russia, because in my, he's so weak, and the, the Russians, they're going to just take over the world, and it just, and, and the world was coming apart. Okay, I, I don't mean any disrespect to these men. Richard Nixon is dead. Gerald Ford is dead. Jimmy Carter's up in his 90s and is doing a great work building homes, but he will die soon. And God is doing his thing. He's not flummoxed by Nixon or Ford or Carter. So now let me try and roll the clock ahead 44 years from now, okay? I'm probably going to be dead. Donald Trump's going to be dead. Joe Biden's going to be dead. And you know what? God's going to be doing his thing. Please, if you're convinced that God is sovereign and is able to pull off something like this, it does not compute that you're stressed out about the election. I have concern if this guy wins or this guy's elected or this guy's reelected. I, okay, I get that. There's policy. I, I get that. But in the end, God's going to do his thing just like he's going to do it here. That's the God we serve. Let's play our faith out in our life. So Moses is in the middle of that. God's called him to go. But he's still got questions. Chapter 4, verse 1. He says, what if they will not believe or listen to what I say? But they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. We think you're wacky, Moses. I don't think it was really God. All right, Lord says, good. I'll give you a couple, couple things here you can do. Verse 2, what is that in your hand? It's a staff. Throw it down on the ground, verse 3. So then he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And, and Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by his tail. So he stretched it out, caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, he appeared to you. Second example, verses 6 through 8. Then the Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. He put his hand in the bosom, and when he took it out, behold, it was left like snow. I said, put it back in. Again, when we took it out, it was restored 
like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. Verse 9. But if they will not believe you, these two signs, or heed what you say, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become, on, become blood on the dry ground. Moses, I've called you. I'm going to put my seal on you. There will be no doubt that I am speaking and working through you. God is able to do that. He is able, if he's sovereign, he is able to affirm the call and the words and the work of his spokespeople. That's not outside his skill set. And historically we have seen that him do that. Okay, you think Moses is on board. Verse 10. Nope. Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Yeah, Lord, you may do all that stuff, but I, I'm, 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 I'm really bad. I, I like a failed speech. I, the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth or makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you're to say. I, I, Moses, I'm going to give you the words. If you'll just go, I, I, I'll give you the words. So we got this call to speak for God, and sometimes it's overwhelming like it was for Moses. And, and we've, where do we find the strength? Well, the certainty of God's presence and the assurance that he will give us his words. The assurance that he will give us his words. Moses is convinced not. Look at verse 13. Please, Lord, send the message by whomever you will send. Well, in verses 14 to 17, he promises him Aaron. Verses 18 to 29, Aaron and Moses meet with the elders, let me pick it up in verse 29. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which God had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, that he had seen their affliction, well, they bowed low and worshipped. They're convinced. This is God's spokesperson. Now, is that just a, a Moses deal? that we get God's presence and we get the assurance that He'll give us His words. No, I, I would say that extends to every follower, every believer. See, Jesus came to make God known, to make His presence real. And He spent uh, three years in public ministry with uh, several followers, about 12. One of them bailed on Him. It's down to 11. And, and it's right before the crucifixion. So Jesus is going to go to the cross. He's going to resurrect from the dead. Three days later, He's going to be on the Within 40 days, he's going to ascend into heaven. And he makes this promise. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, and he makes this promise in John 14, verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I find that fascinating because he's physically leaving them. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me. But you, even though I'm gone, you will see me because I live in you. You will live also. In that day, you will know that I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He's talking about the Spirit. You are going to experience the presence of God because of the Holy Spirit. He's going to, I'm not going to be there physically, but it's going to be made manifest in your heart. And when you talk about this with people in the world, they think you're, wow, well, you're kind of crazy. You're wacko. Why? Because they don't have the Spirit of God. They don't understand. They don't have the experience you have and I have as followers of Jesus. Uh, second thing, he was talking to his disciples about the fact that they would be persecuted, and they would be dragged before kings and rulers and other things. And he said this to them in Luke 12, 11 and 12. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit, there he is again, he will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Hey, this deal with Moses, this was not a, a kind of a one-time deal. This is how God rolls with his people. He says, I give you my presence and I promise to give you the words to speak. Will you go? Speak to Jesus about that person, that coworker, that friend, that former, that student who needs to know about me. Will you speak for the vulnerable, the poor? Because God really cares about them. Will you speak for justice? Because God is just. And He's counting on His people to advocate for justice. Sometimes people don't want to hear a word for the vulnerable. They don't want to hear a word for the vulnerable. They don't want to hear a word of justice because it's uncomfortable. 
shakes. God's calling us to speak. And we live in a world system that's intentionally trying to deny the existence of God. My opinion, I'm a pastor, it's we're spending out of control because we've lost sight of God. And we need people to speak up and say, no, there is a God. There is a creator. There is one to whom we are accountable. So when I was in college, I was involved with a campus ministry called Campus Crusade. It's now known as Crew. Many of you know I worked on staff with them for a number of years. But this was my junior year, and we've been challenged to go speak for God. So I had a friend. I went to high school with him. We were both chemical engineering majors. We lived in the same dorm. So um, I just set up an appointment. I, w- I said, Melvin, I want to share something that's very personal. I, I just, I, if, would you listen to me? He said, sure. And they had a, a whole checklist of how you're supposed to do it. Well, I did everything wrong. I mean, I apologized. I was nervous. I tripped over my words. I, I hurried. I, I, I did a really poor job. And he had, he had no response. He said, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. And he took this little booklet that was called The Four Spiritual Laws. Well, unbeknownst to me, he looked that over. And sometime during our senior year, he said, Andy, you know, I've, I want to thank you for doing that because I've made a decision for Christ. And, and that was an impetus for it. And I thought, really? As poorly as that went, you really? Well, we graduated. I went to uh, business school at A&M. He went to uh, medical school at the University of Texas, San Antonio. And so for a couple years, we'd see each other now and then. You know what he said to me every time? Thank you so much for sharing that. That, that, That's just kind of redirected my life. And really? Like, I did a really poor job. But it didn't matter. Because the God who's with us and the God who's orchestrating our words was there. Would you go, even when it's scary, and even when it's intimidating, knowing, like Moses, you have the certainty of God's presence. Jesus is manifest in your life, and you have the Spirit of God giving you the words to speak for the moment, trusting Him. Would you go? Would you take a faith a spe- step of faith this week and speak for God? In January of 1997, my wife and I went down to San Jose, Costa Rica. We're going to be missionaries in Chile, and the first thing we did was go to language school in San Jose for seven months. And so we lived with a Costa Rican family, went to the institute, and you had an hour of exercise, an hour of grammar, and then you had a choice. You could be in a conversation class with 10 other gringos and a Costa Rican, and you could have some very stilted Spanish, como esta usted, muy bien, y usted, and it could be... That was one thing you could do. Or you could choose to do what they called fado, where you'd learn a text, memorize a text, and then you would go out and you'd speak it with 10 people and you'd ask questions and then begin a conversation. But as you can imagine, when you're getting started and you don't speak Spanish very well, that would be pretty intimidating to go find 10 people, shopkeepers and stuff. But that's, that's the route we went. So I met with my instructor and, and we, we scripted out a little text that I would do. And I told him, yeah, but I'm really nervous. He said, yeah, I know, Andy, but I'm with you. You go do this this afternoon, and then we're going to meet tomorrow, and we're going to talk about it. I'm with you. So I went home, and I, I told a lady who was the, the, she was the owner of the house. We were living in Asaida. I'm really nervous. Oh, you're real. So, oh, Andres, you're going to be great. You're gonna, she, I, I'm with you. And so I went. And I go up to my first um, person, kind of, and, and my text was four lines. Hi, I'm Andy. I'm a student. I want to practice with you Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for 10 minutes. Would you agree to meet with me? That, that was my text. But it took me two lines in to make a mistake. If, you, if you've had Spanish, you know, there's two. You know that, Matt. You know that. There's two forms of the verb to be. So I said, hola, me llamo Andres. Estoy estudiante. Ah, Wrong. I get corrected. I'm my second sentence in. It's supposed to be soy estudiante. So I'm, now I'm thrown off and I'm flustered. But, you know, I got 10 people to agree. And for seven months, three times a week, we did it. And I learned Spanish. I made some great friends along the way. But you know what empowered, that to, empowered me to do that? I had some people said, I'm with you. And I had some people said, I'll even give you the words to say. How much more with the eternal God who says, I'm with you. And not I'm going to be waiting for you when you come back, like my instructor said, and the lady who was, but I, I, I'm with you when you're right there. And you know, and when I'm tripping on those first couple conversations, I, I just had to kind of fumble for the words myself. But the Spirit of God says, no, 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 no I, I'll be there. I'll give you the word. I'll give you the words you need. 
It's in the certainty of the presence of God and the assurance that He will give us the words to speak that we find the strength to speak for God. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for that promise that you are with us um, and you promise to give us the words. And, and Lord, is intimidating. It's scary to speak for you because we've got a world who doesn't want to hear about you. They're, they're pleased to be living life their way, doing their thing as if you don't exist. But you've called us to be your people, to speak for you, to say, yes, there is a God who cares about the souls of people who created people and who's created them in His image. Uh, There's a God who cares about the vulnerable, He cares about the poor, He cares about justice, and He cares about people ultimately being connected with Him. Uh, Would you give us the strength to speak? Would we find it in your presence and in the assurance you'd give us your words? I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.